Hey y'all, this is Sandy. Uh, this is our third contest. And uh, in this contest I'm making as a celebration of the uh, end of the, the demise of the lockdowns for the coronavirus because this is a figure that you're gonna get of the goddess of disease from my game Glorantha the God's War called Malia. And oops. It's a pretty fabulous figure. You can see that dropping it didn't hurt it. It has multiple arms because disease has many forms. Uh, each arm is a different like type. It has a giant open gaping mouth because it eats everything and is blind because, you know. So it's pretty cool. It's big. It's elaborate. It's scary. And it can be yours. Just post your comments down below and talk about how the goddess of disease has influenced your life probably for the worse but if you can think of a way it's made it better you can mention that one sentence goddess of disease it'll be signed by me and you'll be given it hi today i'm going to perform the rarely seen feat nowadays of having a whole talk about parasites and disease and only mentioning the coronavirus or the Wuhan virus or COVID-19, whatever you want to call it, once, which is right now. There, done. No more of it. If you're familiar with ecology or you've read a book like Parasite Rex, you're probably expecting me to talk about how parasites can mind control their hosts, affect the behavior in ecology, and dominate the planet. But I'm not. I'm going to discuss something a lot more insidious and terrifying. A sentient being who uses parasites to accomplish his goals and might be partly parasitic itself. Now, first off, could an intelligent parasite exist? Well, we have to distinguish between two general classes of parasites. There's parasites who move from host to host, like vampire bats or fleas, and there's parasites that stick to the same victim most of their life, like botfly larvae or tapeworms. Of course, adult botflies go from host to host, but they're not actually the parasites. Um, parasites that move from host to host usually don't do that much damage. They drink a little of blood or other fluids and then they move on. There's a few exceptions like lampreys and they really do a number on the host fish. But these mobile parasites that go around, they have to live in the ecology of the world, they have to avoid predators, they have to seek out prey. So they seem to be about as smart as similar non-parasitic creatures, like a bed bug is as smart as any other tiny insect, which isn't much, right? Vampire bats have a complex social structure, not at the primate level, but pretty good for a creature that has a skull an inch long. Now, parasites that stick to a single person are usually, they can inflict a lot more damage than one of the external parasites. But these creatures seem to degenerate evolutionarily over time. They lose their brains, they lose their locomotive capability, they lose more and more. Look at this pathetic creature. Don't worry doesn't infect humans. It doesn't have eyes. It doesn't have a mouth. It doesn't have a brain. It doesn't have a digestive tract. It can lay eggs and wiggle, and that's about all it can do. Now, its ancestors long ago were a free living organism. It dug burrows, we assume, it sought out mates, it hunted prey, did all kinds of things. Now look at it. Now, on the other hand, what would a worm like this do with a powerful brain if it had one? It lives inside another animal's intestine. What could it think about except, I wish I didn't live inside an intestine, you know? That's what life would be like if he wasn't a disgusting parasite. I don't think there's much hope for an internal or host-sticking parasite to become sentient because all the evolutionary things make you degenerate. But what if another creature evolved to host those parasites and to use them. There's a common misconception among people that diseases and parasites always evolve towards being less lethal. The logic here is, of course, is a disease is better off if the host survives longer. Scientists used to think that too, at least before the 1980s. Now we know at least two reasons why this isn't so. Why diseases can evolve to be deadlier to their host. The first reason is that there's a trade-off involved. A disease which is more virulent more infect, right, and more deadly, usually spreads more easily. A disease which is less virulent, less lethal, spreads more slowly. There's not as big a parasite burden on the host. Now, one of the most lethal diseases in the world is malaria. It kills hundreds of thousands of people a year. Now, 
There are different types of malaria. Most types produce a fairly mild version of the disease that persists in the host for years. That's the famous version you see referenced in old stories, especially from Britain, where some guy that used to live in India or Africa comes back to England and every once in a while gets a touch of the old malaria with fever and chills. So these aren't fun to get, but people with one of these, what they're called benign malaria, last a long time. You can go on years and years of that. But there's another type called malignant malaria. This type doesn't politely hide in your body and only occasionally burst forth. It is aggressive. It makes you sicker and sicker and sicker and more fever and more chills and, until you die or you know medical treatment is able to eliminate it. Now, the old way of thinking would assume that malignant malaria must be an evolutionary misfit. It can't be as successful as the mild types. But this isn't so. Malignant malaria is more common than all four other types put together. It's really widespread and it's lethal at the same time. Other diseases do this too. They trade longevity for lethality. Rabies, pneumonic plague. They kill the host fast, but they're really infectious while they have it. So this infectiousness concept is one reason a disease might not evolve towards mildness. The ultimate non-infectious disease is Hansen disease, used to be called leprosy. This is really hard to catch. Sometimes you only catch it at one time in your life. You can be around lepers your whole life and never get it. So it doesn't spread very fast. Of course, if you have it, you last a long time. But, you know, the question is, which is better ecologically? For, for the disease, I mean, bubonic plague or leprosy? It's hard to say. I don't want to make a judgment call. I don't like either one of them. And there's another reason that diseases become uh, lethal, though, and this is a very interesting reason because it depends on the host organism's ecology. Adorable monkey picture here. Everyone knows that diseases can cross from one organism to another. We had the swine flu. We had the bird flu. We had Ebola. Lots of diseases can cross. Okay. Now, consider the ramifications of this. Let us assume that you are a monkey in Africa, and there is some kind of mild but endemic disease that which affects your species, okay? No big deal. But there's other primates living in your area too, like humans. And these are close enough to you that your diseases can infect them. So what? Well, this is a real thing. And frequently these zoonoses, diseases that cross over to other species are super lethal. And it's not just because the other guy isn't used to having them. It's also because it is in your disease's interest for your species to thrive for lots of hosts. So consider you're that monkey. Other monkeys and primates are competitors to your monkey species, right? So if your endemic disease, which doesn't hurt you that much, but is lethal to chimpanzees, macaques, and humans, that's good for you, the host monkey. And so it's good for the disease too, which will evolve towards being even more lethal to new hosts. Let's use one crude and terrifying example. When Europeans came to the New World, they accidentally brought measles with them. Now, measles is not a great, is not a good disease. It still kills 90,000 people a year. Um, it's actually gone up since uh, people become anti-vaccine. But it turns out that measles, if you're not, if you haven't kind of grown up with it or lived with it in your society for a thousand years, it's a deadly killer. It's actually a really lethal disease to people who are not descended from a long line of measles survivors. Europeans didn't know this. Occasionally someone would be killed by measles or go deaf from measles or some other thing, but it was pretty rare. But measles killed Native Americans. Smallpox was lethal to Europeans too, but was even more lethal to the natives, partly due to cultural reasons, because natives had the culture of visiting the sick. So some guy would get sick with smallpox, everyone would go visit them, they'd all catch it. Now, the main reason that the Aztecs who were bigger in number, more socially advanced in some ways, extremely organized, uh, but they lost to the Spanish. One of the reasons is that during the war against them, the Aztecs had a smallpox epidemic. Now, the Europeans were on some level aware of this advantage. I'm sure everyone has heard the story of bad people giving smallpox blankets to the Indian. So let me just address this right now. This actually didn't happen on any kind of, right? There was a British officer, a brigadier general in the 1700s, who said we should give smallpox blankets to the Indians, but no one would do it. That was like considered bad, which it would have been. So it was never done. And also it wasn't Americans doing it anyway. It was a British guy who wanted to do it. It's possible there was a case somewhere where some guy gave the Indians a smallpox blanket, but it was never an organized plan. Just so you know, there, just want to get that myth out of the way. Now, disease is a powerful weapon. It beat the Aztecs, right? It 
uh, overthrew this the feudalism with the Black Death. It's not hard to imagine a species which has evolved to use disease in a way to eliminate competitors. Now, this creature would need to have defenses against parasites. Probably, it would, or what it would need to do is be able to reprogram and repair and replace its own genetic code so it could adapt to anything. It would also need to controllably host disease organisms in special pockets maybe in this body where the disease organism would be safe from the host antibodies, plus they're available for it to use to spread to other targets. Now, since its cells can reprogram its own genetic makeup, it would probably have a host of enzymes that can look at foreign genetic structure and reprogram them. Now, I'm not saying it would reprogram human DNA, no, no, if it got a sample of human DNA, see, it sucks blood for part of its food, sucks some human blood, then it reads the human DNA with its enzymes and special cells. Then it doesn't re-engineer re the human DNA, it re-engineers the diseases it holds so that now they infect humans. In other words, this creature designed its own diseases, incubates them inside their body, and modifies them genetically to target host species. Now, I've invented a creature like this from a hyperspace game. I call them the Nomians. Now, no doubt the Nomians have taken over everything on their home world, destroying and designing their ecology with targeted diseases. Now they've come off world, bringing the plagues with them and constantly modifying and changing for new ones. We know that diseases don't stay static. They change over time. There's a new flu every year. The Nomians would control and accelerate this process. So they would be really fast to react to things. Now, if a Nomian got a hold of a sick human, that would give them a new kind of disease. They could re-engineer the disease the human had for them to use. Imagine a form of uh, cancer that could be spread by sneezing or sleeping sickness that could be spread by mosquitoes in temperate areas instead of having to rely on the hot climate tsetse fly. The Nomians would obviously be hated and feared by every other species. But who would dare to invade one of their planets? Now, I'm the, not the first one to come up with such a concept. Orson Scott Card, the science fiction author, created the Descoladores, who are actually never seen in his books, but they communicate with viruses. So my theory is that the entire civilization of these Nomias would be based around disease-like techniques. For example, their weapons, instead of blasters or missiles, could be based on infecting enemy ships with softer viruses and other pest-like disasters. That's how they think. When they encounter a new kind of ship or weapon, they'd approach it from the viewpoint of how to weaken and debilitate it, not just blow it up. As the Nomians spread, other civs would either have to evacuate from their path or use some kind of scorched earth technique to evacuate planets and quarantine them. I base the appearance of the Nomians partly on disease-carrying arthropods from Earth. There's pockets on the body that look like blisters or warts. The idea is these host the diseases, they can maybe spray out the diseases, and of course they have full control over the, their diseases. Now, one, there's a disadvantage of using disease to knock out your enemy, and that is that it takes time. If you're attacking me with your blaster pistol and I spray you with pneumonic plague, well, pneumonic plague is super deadly. It basically kills 100% of humans that catch it. But it takes a few days, so by the time you're dead, I mean, I will long since have been shot by your blaster and be dead. But you go back to your ship, they get pneumonic plague, you go somewhere else, or Ebola, or whatever it is they've got, you spread it. Over time, you killed me with your blaster, but you yourself, infected, have killed far more members of your species. Or else your species has had to kill you to keep you from spreading, or they've had to quarantine you and spend lots of money and effort and have doctors. It's, it's, it's a lot harder to handle a guy who has a disease than an enemy you just shoot. Now, I would imagine because the Nomians you know, can be killed this way, they don't have a fast acting weapon, they probably don't have much of a sense of individualism. When a Nomian dies, it's like, that's how the universe works. There's lots of parasites that the life cycle is that they die when the host dies. But the after effects of that Nomian sacrifice, that can last for decades and benefit their disgusting species. And that's what I have to say about Nomians and a disease carrying creature. <laughs>